Hello and welcome to the Spectre of Communism podcast. We're back for a special bonus episode because in the time between ending season one and now, a massive wave of student protests has broken out across the whole globe, starting in the USA, but then moving across the northern border into Canada, reaching into Europe, into the Middle East, as far as Australia and Japan. And this is being described as the most significant student protest in US and possibly world history since the insurrectionary movements around the Vietnam War and 1968. So we couldn't help but record a new episode and comrades of the international Marxist tendency, soon to be the RCI, the Revolutionary Communist International, have been doing their duty as communists and intervening energetically in the protests wherever they've broken out at campuses in their cities, towns and communities. Students have established encampments across these campuses, and we'll talk about those in more detail in a moment. And we're going to be interviewing a series of comrades from countries where the encampment movement has been very big to hear about the mood on the ground, their experiences, and the repression that they faced. But to set that all up, we're going to have an introduction by a member of our international secretariat, who you'll remember as our last guest on the Spectre of Communism. He's Fred Weston, and we're speaking to him in London. Fred, thanks for joining us once again. Thanks for having me again. So can you put this movement in context because it erupted seemingly out of nowhere and it's become a major factor, I would say, in world politics, in the considerations of the ruling class regarding the genocidal war that the Western bourgeoisie is supporting and that Israel is conducting in Gaza? Well, the events taking place in Gaza are highlighting the 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 dramatic situation that the actual whole global capitalist system is facing we've been through a period of inflation the pandemic um constant attacks on welfare on benefits on the healthcare system on the pension system um combined with the climate change i mean there's this the world is in turmoil mm. and this is being felt by millions billions of people around the world especially the youth who are looking at a future which is one of an unstable society, uh, wars, civil wars, um, conflicts um, around the globe. Um, this is the general scenario in which this event has, has erupted. And we should say, much like the Black Lives Matter protest, which this current wave of uh, yes. protests has been compared to, the flashpoint was police brutality and racism on the part of the US state, but obviously it tapped into a, a deeper mood of general anger against the system. Would you say that's the case now? Yes, it's part of the same process. Um, the, the, the movement of the Black Lives Matter brought out the anger of the youth towards the system as a whole and the killing of um, one black uh, man um, at the, the hands of the police which has happened many times, of course. It's not the first time, unfortunately. But this time it triggered that movement because, you know, there's a quantity and quality. You can only take so much before the anger erupts onto the streets. And it's erupting again now over the question of, uh, of Gaza. We've explained many times in our articles that Gaza is becoming like a focal point in the radicalization of the youth and the workers worldwide. Globally, it's part of the class struggle on an international scale. Mm. Um, and the brutality of what the uh, Israeli regime is doing in Gaza is uh, is feeding the anger um, and the radicalization against a system that can allow this to happen. Um, not just the regime in, in Israel, but the fact that the American government, the British government, all you know, West European governments are backing Netanyahu to one degree or another. And in, in effect, in practice, what's happening is a kind of theater is being played out where Biden um, shows so-called concern mm. that um, that American weapons, get this, might actually be used in Gaza if they give them to Israel. I often wonder, what do you think a country is going to do if you give it weapons that's at war? Oh, purely purely defensive so weapons, Fred. Yeah. Purely defensive weapons. It, 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 it's just so much nonsense. What, what is actually happening, Biden is thinking, first of all, the elections at the end of the year, 
Mm. He has lost a lot of young people's votes. Mm -hmm. He has lost a lot of Muslim votes in some swing states. And in a situation where the opinion polls show that Trump is most likely uh, to win, um, he's maneuvering like hell, thinking of his own um, um, position. Right. It's not. It's not concerned for the Palestinians at all. And young people know that. They can see it. That it's. It's just hypocrisy. Now, all this at a certain point was inevitably going to produce a movement uh, of some kind. And what started at Columbia University is a confirmation of what we said, that this uh, this war in Gaza um, is having an impact worldwide. And it erupted at Columbia, spread quickly to Yale, and then one university after another mm -hmm. across the United States. Um, initially, uh, and, and still, still it's ongoing, the authorities in the United States, the government is hope, was hoping, hoping that if we brutally repress quickly this movement, we'll nip it in the bud. Yes, but they didn't. Re they, they're not. They don't realize how widespread the anger is, how widespread the radicalization is, and all it did was to feed the movement, and make it stronger, and spread it further. Yeah, we should say actually that the protests have remained um, peaceful. The only violence that we've seen really has come from the state forces sent in to crush them. That's right. But things didn't really kick off to the extent that we're now seeing until the campus authorities at Columbia called in the police, called in, I think, at Columbia, the state troopers to break mm -hmm. up the encampments, which they did so brutally. And we've seen this replicated in one encampment after another. Uh, police and state troopers being sent in with tear gas, with batons, with concussion grenades in some instances. And it was in response to that violence from the state that the movement became more radical and more widespread. That's right. Um, the police in America are giving a very hard lesson to, the, to this generation of youth on what the nature of the state actually is. Uh, it's like you don't you don't need to read, read Lenin's State and Revolution to realize what the role of the police is in the United States today. Um, but this is angering the youth, and it's spreading the solidarity movement. It spilled over into Canada with some huge movements in places like Toronto, Montreal, McGill University, mm -hmm. um, in, in Vancouver, etc. And then across the ocean to Europe, uh, further afield uh, to Australia, Japan, etc. Something like a hundred campuses worldwide to one degree or another, have been involved in the solidarity encampments. Can I add one thing as well? Because I think that in addition to revealing the role of the state, we've also seen the role of the capitalist prostitute press in yes. the course of this movement. I've got some headlines here that give a sense of the way that the ruling class and its mouthpieces have been characterizing these protests. The Guardian um, says, Amid reports, Jewish students in Sydney afraid to go to class, minister urged to condemn university encampments. The Telegraph, Jewish students confront extreme anti-Semitism at Columbia protest camp. New York Post, anti-Israel protesters now demand University of California cuts ties with Hillel, Jewish groups, it's anti-Semitism. And Fox News, UCLA forced to move to remote learning amid anti-Semitic protests, encampments on campus. So these Listen. protests have been widely and roundly slandered as anti-Semitic in precisely the way that we've seen the left hammered as anti-Semitic time and time again in the past few years, and particularly the movement in solidarity with Palestine. So what does this really show us about the nature of the press and its complicity in the repression that's followed? Well, the media is owned by the capitalists, and it pushes the line that the capitalist class wants people to hear. But what that is doing is actually undermining their own authority because the young people on these protests are not threatening Jewish students. In fact, a significant number of Jewish students are participating in the protests in solidarity with the Palestinians. And this has been the case in many campuses. Mm -hmm. That is highlighted less. Um, but the irony is that these Jewish students, in some cases, are ending up on the receiving end of the batons of the police. So yes. you have police officers beating Jewish students, and then the media 
presenting a position that it's the violence and it's the anti-Semitism of the students that's causing all the trouble. Mm. It's just completely false. There and is also, none of this. And also, I, I never thought I'd say this, but to quote the rapper Macklemore from his recent single uh, released to support the Palestine protest, Hins Hall, we see the lies in them, claiming it's anti-Semitic to be anti-Zionist. I've seen Jewish brothers and sisters out there and riding in solidarity and screaming free Palestine with them. And it's true. We've all seen it. There have been big, visible contingents of anti-Zionist Jewish students taking part in these protests. They clearly don't feel that they're anti-Semitic. Of course they're not. Of course they're not. This is, this is absolute nonsense. This anti-Semitism accusation is thrown at anybody that protests on, from the left, in effect. Um, they use it systematically. Um, when it, it, everybody taking part in the movement can see there's none of this. There is no, there's no threats to, 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 to Jewish students taking place. It's the way it's, it's being presented uh, in the media to get to try and shape public opinion, but it's not working. Public opinion, you can see it. There's massive support for the cause of the Palestinians. Um, and the, the police repression, the media lies, mm. is only serving to expose um, the system for what it actually um, is. And not just the police and the media, but also we've seen in many places, UCLA in particular, Zionist counter-protesters, extremely reactionary, being used basically as a supplementary paramilitary force by That's the right. police. There's videos of Zionist counter-protesters physically attacking student encampments using uh, mace, using fireworks, using cudgels, and the police are standing by watching, letting it happen, basically right. letting the counter-processors soften up the students before they go in themselves. That's right. You see, you saw that in Vancouver where they uh, they went brutally in against the students. Um, and when the when these Zion organized uh, Zionist thugs, which is what they were, yes, come in, the police stands by. But that's always been the case. The police, uh, it, 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 there's a, it goes back decades. Whenever um, you have a demonstration of you know fascist elements, right wing elements in Britain or Italy or anywhere. The police is a lot softer on these people than it is on the, um, you know, the, the youth on the left, which shows that these elements are a tool of the state mm. and of the ruling class. We know from the January 6th mob that there's also a bit of crossover because a few police officers were identified amongst that mob. That's right. That's right. But um, the uh, what 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 is now obviously um, uh, attracting the attention of the movement and concentrating the minds is the fact that after several weeks, in fact, a couple of months of stalling um, their attack on Rafa, um, the Israeli military have prepared the ground to go in. The latest figure I've seen, I saw it last night, is that now 300,000 Palestinians have left Rafa on orders of evacuation and the evacuation area has been increased. Um, these poor Palestinians who have had to move several times, you know, from, from Gaza City to Khan Yunis to Rafa, constantly being moved on, moved on. And you see them taking their mattresses, their tents, and the, the few belongings they've been able to hold on to, some with some on foot, some in vehicles, some with, a, with a, uh, you know, carts pulled by donkeys, mm. um, desperately trying to get away from places where they think they can be killed and bombed. Where are they sending them? They're sending them to areas where there's been heavy fighting. That means they're unsafe areas. There's going to be chemicals. There's going to be unexploded um, uh, bombs, missiles, etc. The sewage system is in a state of disrepair. The water supply is bad. Um these are the conditions they're being sent to. These are the so-called safe areas. And now in Rafa, the latest, they've, they've forced the hospital to close. Mm. You hear reports of people dying from what nobody should die of, you know, lack of dialysis services, lack of basic care for um, illnesses which can be uh, um, managed or even cured in normal circumstances. Now they have become a death sentence. So on top of the dead who are dying under the bombs, we should be adding to the list the number of people who are dying because of lack of uh, the medical care. You listen to the doctors telling you when, you know, bodies are arriving, headless, uh, limbs. They don't even know who the people, who these people were. Yeah.
This is now happening again in yeah. Rafa. The logic inside Israel has not changed fundamentally over the past few months. It's the same position. Netanyahu depends on the far right to stay in power. His personal, it's a bit like Biden. Mm. They're putting their personal political careers um, above, you know, the interests of the lives of thousands and thousands of ordinary um, civilians. They don't care a damn for the lives of the Palestinians. Um, in order to stay in power, he needs to appease the right wing, who have repeatedly said you make any deal um, that involves a ceasefire now um, and we will bring the government down and yeah. we'll leave you basically in the hands of the judges in Israel mm. to your possible fate. Because there was, there was some talk of a ceasefire deal uh, for a couple of days around right. the time that uh, the IDF launched its operation in Rafa, but that seems to have been scuppered. Well, the thing is this, every time... We've been faced with a possible, you know, a new attack, a new offensive, etc. Mm -hmm. We've had the same scenario that there's more or less the same deal, which the Americans have been uh, part of a three phase deal, each phase about six weeks long. Each phase would see the re release of a number of um, uh, uh, hostages that are uh, being held in Gaza. Um, this time Hamas accepted a deal and then the Israelis said that wasn't the deal they agreed to. Mm. Every time Netanyahu has put a spanner in the works to stop the deal going ahead, finding some reason not to do. Now, this is causing internal strife inside Israel because in Israel, a majority, I mean, the majority of the population is still massively in favor of the war. I mean, mm. the hype inside Israel, of course, is Hamas must be destroyed at, at any cost. But... There is a, an important division over the question of the ceasefire. A majority now are, are, are saying we should have some kind of ceasefire mm. to allow the, the, the hostages to be released. Mm -hmm. But Netanyahu's position is such that if he does that, that, that is, if he actually actually meets the demands of the majority of the population in Israel, he could fall from government and um, uh, that would be the end of him politically. So he doesn't give a damn. I mean, in, in reality, he doesn't care about the hostages either. It's just a show. Um, he's he's putting forward the agenda of the far-right Zionists who are out to uh, not just uh, uh, destroy Hamas, which they will fail to do, by the way. Mm. The, the, the renewed fighting in the north is a, is a, is a confirmation of that. Hamas has, re has moved and reorganized. Um, you cannot destroy the reasons why Hamas exists. That's the problem. You cannot repress the Palestinians for decades, stepping up the huge wave of, of, of attacks now taking place in the West Bank. 500 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank, and there's no actual war going on there, just constant armed conflicts between the settlers and the army and, uh, and Palestinians. They will never uh, destroy it. But the logic is that um, Netanyahu needs to keep going. Now, this means, unfortunately, that we look at, we're looking at more bloodshed, more butchery in Rafa. Already, you see the figures starting to grow again. The, 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 the images, the pictures, the, the films of, on TV of, of mothers weeping over their dead children, over their husbands who have died, husbands who were not at home and find their whole family has been killed in the bombing these images are coming back to the to 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 the tv screens and this can only cause increased rage and anger mm -hmm. amongst the healthy elements in the west it, which is ordinary young people ordinary working class people are disgusted by what they see mm -hmm. and this can only give um, strength to the protest movement that is what we're seeing in in um, in in the coming period. Mm. And speaking of those healthy elements, we're going to turn to one of our comrades who has been intervening in the protests that Fred and I have been discussing. So we're going to take a detour to Canada, and we're here with comrade Sebastian from Montreal, a member of the Canadian organization of the IMT, soon to be launched as the Revolutionary Communist Party. Sebastian, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hi, Joe. Yeah, it's good to be here. Exciting times. Absolutely. And I want to hear all about the exciting times that you guys have been experiencing at McGill University, where I understand you've been involved in the encampments. Can you tell us a little bit about 
what's gone on, what the mood is like, what the situation is, and what sort of demands uh, have been raised by the student protesters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, so I'm at the McGill encampment in Montreal, which I think was was the second encampment to go up in Canada, the movement spilling across the border from the United States. Um, and I'll say, especially the beginning period was was very exciting. I mean, it was a real, I don't know, I guess a melting pot of, of different ideas, different tendencies amongst the left that became a real focal point within the city of Montreal, you know. Um, you know, of course, the encampment itself, but also outside of its its gates, its barriers, if you will, uh, people from all over the city coming to to congregate to discuss ideas. Um, there were all manner of, of teach-ins and different things being done, but ultimately, I think the the thing that stood out most to me was just the hunger for you know for ideas to organize and to really escalate this movement. Right, I think mm. particularly in Montreal, we have seen weekly marches since October seventh, like nonstop. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets over this period. And of course, it hasn't moved the needle on the Canadian ruling class's response to this, their continued support of, of Netanyahu's, you know, uh, gang of extremists, one inch. And so, yeah, the question in everyone's mind is what's next? How do we escalate? Mm -hmm. How were our comrades received as revolutionary communists entering these encampments? <laughs> Yeah, well, um, one thing I think a lot of people have remarked is, I guess, surprised to some extent at, you know, maybe the more overtly communist nature of some of these encampments. Like if you talk to young people at these, a lot of people will call themselves communists. Of course, that means different things to different people. But generally, the mood is moving in a revolutionary direction. Uh, very much so, right? Like, I think on the first day, there was a big banner being painted uh, talking about, you know, like, this is the revolution, which might be a little bit premature, but it, it was a, a sign of where the mood was at, right? Mm. Uh, and so our comrades, part, you know, came and participated in that. And our ideas were, were very well received, right? I mean, everywhere, again, the, the need is so obvious for a more advanced form of organization mm -hmm. than what we currently have. Um, and so we are putting forward those ideas, you know, for how the movement can self-organize, uh, and reach out to, to broader layers, right? Uh, of course, also getting workers involved on the campuses uh, and also extending it you know, beyond the gates of the university and trying to get the broader working class involved. Um, we're talking a lot about, you know, the nature of imperialism itself, why it is that, you know, the Canadian state and even allegedly neutral institutions like, you know, McGill, allegedly a public university, are so deeply invested in you know, this ongoing, um, you know, settling of Palestinian lands, weapons companies, all of these things. Like, why is it that all of this is so integrated? The complete dependence of, of financial capital. Um, yeah, these are all these different ways that I think this movement is really opening up people's eyes to a communist perspective more than ever before. I've just seen in the last few hours, as of the time of recording, that the encampment at the University of Alberta was brutally destroyed by the police, by the Mounties, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Um, one of our comrades was injured and a number of others have been injured and some have been arrested, charged with various things. What is the prospect for that kind of repression at McGill? Obviously, we've seen police and Zionist goons being hurled against encampments in the States, in UCLA and other places. What's the situation as far as the response by the campus authorities and also, you know, the local uh, government administration as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is a very immediate question here. Um, I mean, at first, the uh, you know, the McGill administration, um, you know, these bureaucrats that have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year. Um, we're very happy to kind of wait the encampment out. I don't think they took it very seriously at first. Um, but as the movement has only grown in size and scope, uh, they are starting to get a bit more worried. And so actually this morning, I think like just two hours ago, um, there was, they filed for an injunction to, uh, to clear the encampment. And I am still waiting to hear the result of that injunction, but you know, their, their case for it was, well, this is private property. Which is of course ridiculous. We're students in this university, but this is private property. We're going to clear it on those grounds. So. I imagine that the courts will side with the administration on that, which of course then gives 
uh, you know, the authority to the police to come in and clear the encampment. And of course, like you said, we've seen how this has gone uh, at other campuses, of course, across the United States, you know, brutally like at UCLA, but uh, also now in Canada here, right? And like our comrades in, in Calgary found out the hard way. Um, yeah, this is a very immediate perspective. And so, of course, we are trying to, you know, to, to rally and mobilize as many people to help to defend this encampment and also spread it again. Because I think one of the things that we really saw at Columbia is that, you know, trying to repress the movement, uh, in a sense, only fanned the flames, right? Mm. It spread what was one encampment on one campus to be a national movement, right? It's spread it all over the place. And the same thing is happening in Montreal now. Just yesterday, there's an encampment that has started at uh, UCAM. There are now uh, CEGEPs, which is like a Quebec peculiarity, sort of in between high school and university. There are high school students that are now coming out to these encampments that you know t- are, are tr- talking with us, trying to figure out how we can spread this encampment movement to high schools as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and ultimately also a lot of workers, right? Which is, of course, the you know, the fundamental is a step that I think the ruling class fears most of all. So the more that these different layers are mobilized, right, I think this is what will, in a sense, protect and also expand this movement more than anything else. And do you have any message to share with other students and also workers coming out in solidarity as part of this movement internationally? Yeah. Um, well, a couple of lessons that we've learned is that the encampments themselves are are very much an experiment in, in democracy, um, which is, is really fascinating to witness. You know, it is, yeah, people trying to come together uh, and to fight against this genocide, to fight against imperialism. Um, but very quickly, I think also lessons are being learned about how that democracy must function is that, you know, we have to have as much discussion um, as many different viewpoints to be able to make good decisions, but then we have to be united in action as well. So mm-hmm. regularly well-organized meetings, you know, with uh, elected committees that are recallable to the encampment and so on are very, very important to make sure that, you know, the movement can continue to act in a united way. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing, as I said before, I mean, this the slogan we've gotten from the U.S., we keep us safe, right? When we're faced with university administrators who will hypocritically you know, talk all kinds of nonsense about anti-Semitism or whatever, and then sick riot police on their own students. The only ones that we can really count on for uh, for security are ourselves. And I guess the main thing I would say as well is, um, you know, I think on on campuses in particular, I think there can be a little bit of a tendency to to be inward looking or to sort of focus only on the campus itself. But what we have found actually is that there is immense solidarity to be found. Uh, on the one hand, on workers on the campuses, you know, we've been chatting with library workers, we've been chatting with janitors mm-hmm. on the campus, coming out and showing their solidarity. And through this, you can find contact into the broader working class, right? People who will go to their unions and ask them to take a stand, you know, people who can talk to workers in other industries and so on, right? Um, ultimately, this is the, you know, the fanning of the flames that I think will... will um, yeah, we'll turn this into something bigger. So last week we had our cell meeting just on the grass outside the encampment. Mm -hmm. And um, this high school teacher came and just sat down and joined the conversation and so on and very much enjoyed the meeting. And at the end of it, he was remarking that, you know, it's, it's, it's really not our ideas that are radical. It is, it is reality itself that is radical. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a a good representation of what the effect that this movement is having. Uh, ended up buying a copy of our paper. He ended up getting taking a stack of our flyers and uh, saying that he would be handing them out at his high school, right? So I think these are exactly the sorts of connections that can be made in this movement. Mm, that sounds like the students have been teaching the teachers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's great. Obviously, there's a common sympathy across students and across the working class for not only what's happening in Gaza, but also the treatment that's being meted out against students. I mean, what are students? They're the, they're the children of workers, ultimately. And what are they doing? They're standing up for a just cause and they're getting their heads kicked in by the state goons and their Zionist ancillaries. So, um, it's no wonder that this has tapped into a deep vein of anger across wide layers of society. And it's in building those forces of 
building the connections between the students who are a sensitive barometer for the mood of society and the working class who actually have the power to bring society grinding to a halt, that this movement is going to develop into something that can really stop the ruling class in their tracks. Uh, Sebastian, that was great. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and really great work. Looking forward to seeing you again sometime, maybe for the RCI conference in June. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. And now we have Leah, a comrade of the Revolutionary Communist Party, our British organization in Lancaster, also a student at the University of Lancaster. Leah, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Yeah. So the encampments have only really kicked off in Britain in the last week or two. But can you tell us a little bit about what things are like at Lancaster? How big is the encampments? What's the mood? How are people feeling? How have our demands and how have our uh, ideas gone down as communists intervening in these protests? Uh, yeah, so our encampment started um, last Thursday. Uh, it began with about like maybe under 10 tents. We now have maybe 15. So it's it's slowly growing. Um, but we're trying to really pick that up, um, encouraging people to kind of look at it less as a, a closed circle type event. Um but yeah, I think um, our demands have been received quite well, um, especially the the idea of opening up the books. Um, I think that's quite um, a good demand to put forward in terms of when people suggest divestment um, to really push that a bit further and go, OK, but how are we going to ensure that, that the university does divest? Um, and we're starting to push on um, also student and work control um, but a few people have kind of said that they don't think university management will be happy with that demand. I'm sure um, they won't. So I'm quite certain that they won't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that was, um, I don't think they're going to be happy with any of our demands um, and limiting you know, what we put forward as to what university management will be happy to just hand over. Um, I don't think it's going to get us very far. So there have been encampments popping up all over the country. I've seen reports of relatively sizable protests set up in Cambridge, in Sheffield, in Leeds, in Cardiff, at my hometown, and elsewhere. And comrades of the RCP have been intervening very well. What has been the response from the staff on campus? I'm not talking about the, the bosses, the vice chancellors and senior leadership team. I'm talking about the ordinary faculty members, also mm -hmm. the non-academic staff, the porters, the security staff, the um, you know the, the people who keep the university running. Uh, yeah, so especially the academic staff, I think we've got quite close relations with them in Lancaster anyway, in terms of these you um, from pickets and stuff and previous years. So the UCU um, being but, the Academics Union in Britain, in case uh, anybody's not clear. The University and Colleges Union. Sorry, Leah, carry on. Thank you. Um, yeah, so they've been coming down, offering support. Um, we're also like kind of fostering that relationship by putting forward their open letter that they've made. Um, so they put a motion through the UCU branch, used that to make an open letter, and we've been using that as like part of our demands, um, like showing solidarity with the UCU. Um, they're also offering to hold talks for us as well, like next week. Um, but in terms of like um, non-academic staff, um, security have been a lot warmer than I think a lot of us expected. Mm. Um, some there's like obviously different security guards are going to do different things, but there's one that came down and was like, "Oh, there's some heavy objects. If you need to weigh down your tent um, in this <laughs> place, I can I can help you find them if you like." That's um, amazing. So, yeah, um, and then there has been the odd security guard that's come over and said, you're not allowed to use like the library to go to the loo and stuff like that. And then we spoke to the library security guard. He's like, no, I don't care. Come in. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's very much it's a mixed bag. But I think for the most part, like it's um, maybe a few overzealous um, security members and then a lot of people who are actually on that side and just kind of worry about our safety a little bit. Yeah, there's, there's, so, always, there's always a few jobs worth, aren't there? Um, mm -hmm. You talk about having good relations with the, the faculty members. What has been done in terms of strategic efforts to reach out to the workers on campus? Have there been delegations sent by the students, for example, to meet with representatives from the UCU or other unions organised on campus? 
Um, so with the ECU less so because they've they've been on the camp quite a bit. Right, so they're, just, from the, they're from the having, beginning. Yeah, we've been having casual chats with them. Um, but we've also been kind of, we've got a leaflet that we've been posting under um, lecturers' doors to try and get them to come down. Um, but in terms of like, there's three main unions on our campus. It's the ECU, Unite and Unison. Um, most of the security guards are in Unite. Um, so we're in the middle of putting together a leaflet to go down and talk to um, I know there's someone that we're aware is quite a militant um, trade unionist um, security staff that we're going to go over and try and get in by him um, maybe get them to try and push a motion through but also just you know for our own um, sake on the encampment it's good to have these people on side that's great. And the last thing I want to talk about is sort of a two-part question. I, I've been reading some really inspiring reports from comrades in Britain, around the country, and also uh, in, in Canada and the States as well, about how our ideas, our revolutionary ideas, our Marxist ideas are connecting. I've heard about comrades doing teach-outs and this sort of thing. Um, so firstly, how have you found... Th- that our our political ideas, uh, our our Marxist perspective has gone down with the protesters? Um, Has it connected? And are people interested in what we have to say on on that level? And also, um, what's the mood like? How Mm -hmm. This is a movement which has been inspired by one of the most egregious crimes of imperialism that we've witnessed in in many years and it taps into uh, a deep vein of anger and frustration in society obviously in britain we've got two main parties that both support the genocidal war in gaza both back israel to the hilts so what are people feeling about the system in general yeah um i think like the one thing that links everyone out in the camp is the sense of anger and some of that is a lot more directed than um, others. Obviously, like as members of the RCP, we we know exactly where we're directing that anger, right? But um, there's maybe some people who are kind of just concerned with the weapons manufacturers. Some people who have just like you know seen the horrors in Gaza and decided to join because of that, and don't actually know that much um, about what's going on. So yeah, we've been holding these these teach outs to try and direct this anger. Um, One thing um, in particular is, yeah, there is an anger at both of the political parties, um, but also like the British state more generally, the police um, and also the government um, and everything like that. So we're trying to tap into that. I know there was a a lead off done yesterday on the state because we had a chat like previously about just generally the situation in Palestine, a bit of a history. Um, And what came out of that was a lot of people jumping in saying, I can't trust either of these political parties. And some of that was coming out in hopes for maybe the Green Party to become, you know, a third big party. But some people are like, no, it's parliamentary politics in general. And those are the people that we're trying to kind of drag with us. Um, Yeah, so we've basically been doing um, a teach out every day, um, mainly because there's no real, like, um, excitement from anyone else in the camp to put forward their ideas um, so that really has given us space to just like come through and be like okay we can act as you know an educational force here mm-hmm. um, that's amazing well it sounds like you're doing uh, fantastic work Leah and I know that you have an encampment to return to and uh, you've got work <laughs> still to do in fighting the good fight on your campus so I'll say solidarity and thank you so much for joining us Great, thank you. And now we're joined by Martin, who's a comrade from Defunca, the Austrian section of the International Marxist Tendency. Martin, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. And best of luck with the finger seminar that's coming up soon. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so there's been a big encampment at the University of Vienna that I understand that yourself and a number of the comrades in Austria intervened in can you tell us about what happened with the encampments and how our solidarity action went yes yes um 
So it was uh, it was a reaction of the uh, general mood in the international encampment movement, uh, starting in the United States, uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then uh, last Monday, um, last Monday uh, there was an initiative initiative from the students, uh, from the student movement in Vienna, uh, to start an encamp and encampment at the main university um, at the campus. Uh, it it was called uh, the the global Intifada camp. Mm -hmm. And it started very well. Uh, there were around 200 uh, at the um, at some point, uh, maybe 300 persons present uh, over the day. And uh, at night, there camped around uh, 50 to to 100 students there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it stayed there uh, against the uh, uh, against the campaign of the media and uh, student representative body uh, bodies. Uh, who started the smear uh, smear campaign? Uh, every every camper being uh, uh, anti-Semitic, and so on. And it stayed there for three days mm -hmm. uh, till the uh, till the police uh, dissolved it uh, on on Wednesday. Everyone received a message, uh, and they um, it's it's a huge uh, it's it's a huge building with a big park uh, inside, and the police um, basically closed down every entrance, um, and there were. Around 200, 300 people uh, coming there at night. The police mm -hmm. wouldn't let us in, and uh, we uh, we stayed there uh, the whole night, uh, chanting slogans, uh, blocking the road, uh, and this, it was a real uh, uh, it was a real fiery uh, mood, a real real fighting mood. Um, and in the end, I think it took them it took the police around six hours uh, to to clean out the camp and. Uh, arrest, uh, arrest the last person who who uh, climbed up a tree uh, and was sitting there for for a lot of hours. So the students just refused to budge despite the police moving in. Yes, exactly. Basically, there was a core of some uh, twenty or, or thirty students who refused stayed uh, stayed in there, stayed uh, at the camp. Mm, that's very courageous, and it shows the kind of. Um determination that we've seen from these encampments all over the world. Um, we were particularly impressed to see the valiant defense that the students at UCLA put up where they had the wooden shields and the batons to defend themselves against not just the police, but also the Zionist goons who tried to break the cut the protest. So I think the, the attacks of the ruling class against the Palestine movements uh, 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 everywhere uh, where they, uh, everywhere they are quite similar. The ruling class is attacking the Palestine movement on being uh, against the Jewish people uh, and not against uh, the state of Israel and the genocide uh, which is taking place. But uh, the, the Zionist groups, uh, uh, and especially the propaganda of the ruling class, is especially strong in Austria and Germany. Mm. Um, for example, uh, the enc encampment started uh, and it took them only some hours that the national student uh, representative body uh, uh, immediately called the whole camp uh, anti-Semitic. And they even organized that the Zionists, um, the, the Jewish student representative body, uh, organized a demonstration against the encampment. There were uh, around 30 people, uh, Zionists, there. Um, they didn't chant slogans, but uh, for example, they played, uh, played a song, uh, which is also used by the, by the IDF uh, in the prisons uh, for, for torture reasons. Oh, delightful. Um, and I know this is getting off topic, but I have to ask, since we've all been paying close attention from the International Center and across the whole of the International, um, how is the situation with Alex and Sonia? So these are two Austrian comrades who were victimized by the states. They had a case brought against them, uh, absolutely bogus charges of promoting terrorism by a state court. So... Uh, how are the comrades, and what's the status of the case against them? Yeah, we immediately uh, answered uh, answered these charges uh, with a big uh, solidarity campaign with Sonia and Alex, uh, um, going uh, yeah going to the offensive. Mm -hmm. We organized uh, different uh, different stalls, uh, demonstrations, uh, and uh, different events in solidarity with them and. Uh, uh, the reactions were very, very good. We we got uh, dozens of uh, solidarity messages, donations uh, for um, 
uh, for the court fees. Um, yes, and in the end, uh, they dropped the case because uh, it, it, it doesn't have any any serious base. Uh, that's excellent. Well, congratulations to the comrades, and I'm very glad to hear it. Uh, send send our best from the Spectre of Communism podcast to uh, Alex and Sonia. So last thing, the demonstration at the University of Vienna has obviously been shut down by the police. So what's the situation from here? Are there any other uh, encampments elsewhere in the country? Are there plans to reestablish the encampments in Vienna? What's the status of the protest movement in Vienna at this moment? Um, we Im immediately uh, react to the dissolvement of the camp uh, with organizing a demonstration on the next day. Mm -hmm. There were around uh, 300 or 400 people uh, attending the demonstration. And it, it was good. It, uh, I think it was a, a good step to uh, uh, to channelize the, move, uh, the movement and uh, uh, the, the spirit immediately. And uh, we are arguing that the the mood is out there you know a majority or a big part of the of the students of the youth of the working class is pro palestine and we really have to strengthen the movement and help the movement uh, uh yes to to escalate the movement that that basically that's what we are doing and what we are um arguing in the movement for we really have to go to every university um every school um every workplace we uh um yeah, we, we could do it with uh, leaflets uh, explaining uh, that we have to strengthen the movement. And it's it's totally possible, but mm -hmm. we have to get the message out there and uh, escalate the movement. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Martin. And very best of luck with uh, building the movement from here. Thank you for the invitation. And we're coming full circle. The last comrade we're speaking to hails from the country where this protest movement all began. We have Milos from Minneapolis in the USA. Uh, Milos, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. So uh, Milos, everyone. that's all right. So Milos has uh, intervened at the University of Minnesota and he's going to tell us about the encampment there. Um, so go for it, comrade. Let us know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, after the Columbia University encampment, it, it basically sparked a whole movement inside of the United States. And a few days after, it, it had spread here to the University of Minnesota. Um, the The first encampment started like pretty much before anyone knew that it was going to happen. It started one morning at like 6 a.m. And the police immediately arrested everyone who set up the encampment took him out of jail. Uh, and then the next day, I'm pretty sure uh, they we did it again, basically. And, you know, when when people get immediately arrested by the police, it's easier for the movement to actually grow. Like they mm -hmm. they kind of set kerosene to the fire. Yeah. So the next day uh, there was a protest and me and our other comrade jack we were there since the beginning and uh yeah there was like two or three hundred people that showed up to the protest uh there was an encampment that day too with about 20 tents on one of the lawns at the university and uh yeah we were trying to sell the newspaper we were talking to as many people as possible uh the amount of people that agreed with the necessity of revolution uh, was astounding. Like there is a, a real revolutionary sentiment that's brewing here in America, which is very, very awesome to see. Yeah, and it's not uh, really surprising, right? Because not only are we talking about the belly of the beast, the beating heart of world imperialism, but you've got Genocide Joe in charge. Um, the yep. U.S. is the biggest material benefactor of the Zionist regime in Israel. It's the one that controls the, sp the purse strings as far as allowing the Israeli state to perpetrate its genocidal war against the Palestinians. And I, I was making this point to Fred at the beginning of the podcast, much like the Black Lives Matter movement, which was, of course, primarily triggered by um, the murder of George Floyd, and it was directed against racism and police brutality. 
it tapped into a deeper sentiment of anger and frustration with the system, with the injustices that we see, um, the fact that it seems like there's always money to drop bombs in the Middle East, there's always money to arm US imperialism's murderous allies, but never money to provide jobs, to repair America's crumbling infrastructure. So, And then on top of that, you have the levels of police repression that we've seen. Um, what's the state response been like? You mentioned that comrades and supporters of the encampment were arrested day one. What has been the response from the state forces? Yeah, so uh, ever since the the first people got arrested, there hasn't been any more arrests. Mm-hmm. Um, two days afterwards, oh, well, actually, first there was those like there was nine people that got arrested. The next day the the day that me and the other comrades intervened in um they set up more encampments uh the second night they they packed up all the tents as soon as the police came to the lawn and gave the dispersal order Mm. uh left with no struggle at all then the third night there was another encampment on a on another lawn within the university and that night there was actually a lot of people there like um a really good amount and everyone stayed when they gave the dispersal order everyone locked arms around the lawn and people in the lawn locked arms too Mm -hmm. and the police left that night they didn't try to uh, disperse the encampment they didn't arrest anyone i think they knew that they were outnumbered and the police here know what happens whenever you kind of arrest your own citizens for like protesting and and they they know that it'll spark mm-hmm. a, a wider movement. They've had a history lesson with that yeah. after the twenty twenty uprising. Although we that so, has that, that hasn't stopped them in uh, in UCLA, in Columbia, yeah. in Texas, uh, in Austin. We've seen that the yeah. police have gone in and thrown, as you say, kerosene all over the flames, irrespective yeah. of the fact that that's actually driven the protest to become more radical and to spread nationally and internationally. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. But uh, yeah, uh, I think I think the the fifth night or something like that, the the organizers of the encampment uh, they got a they had a meeting with the board of regents with the University of Minnesota, which is like the board of investors of the university, mm-hmm. and uh, they basically made like a, a backdoor deal where. They were able to get like these very, very, like very weak demands that weren't even met. They just got a seat at the table to have a discussion with them. Mm. And once they got that seat at the table, they immediately said, okay, it's time to take the encampments down. So the organizers of the process itself, they, they capitulated before demands were even met. And it was met with a lot of like frustration from a lot of the people that participated in the encampments like and they they weren't willing to try to escalate the movement in any way shape or form they they capitulated as soon as they got the chance to which is inherent in reformists these these were reformist organizations that were leading the protest movement so at the leadership level sure but what was the mood amongst the rank and file were people willing to keep fighting yeah most definitely i would say it was split down the middle with the rank Mm. and file some people were like very happy that we just got a seat at the table and were able to talk to the investors Mm. other people were mad that we had left before any real demands had been met um it was it was very interesting to see there was a a lot of people who wanted the movement to spread farther and wider Mm. and a lot of disappointment i think a real good chunk of the population here like they got taught a lesson in reformism and the dangers of letting these organizations lead a protest like this because they will capitulate can i ask what sorts of demands were being raised yeah so they i'm I'm pretty sure they got the the public uh like the the investments that the university has been the public investments that the university has made, they got a pie chart of those. That was one of the things they got. 
they're having bi-weekly meetings with the investors of the university. Um, one of them was Israel. Like, uh, there are companies that uh, come to the University of Minnesota to, like, recruit students, like, try to hire them. Mm-hmm. And they're the companies that are, like, Lockheed Martin, like, BlackRock, like, uh, defense contractors. And one of the demands for the students that the students were making was to never let them back on our campus anymore mm-hmm. because, you know, they're investing in the Israeli war machine. Of course. Um, yeah, but instead of that demand being met, the university basically said, we'll just tell the students what they're doing, what these companies are doing. Like, we'll still let them on our campus to, like, hire students and recruit them. Right. But we're just let the students know that they're, like, participating in the Israeli war machine. So, so as far as the disclose and divest demand goes, they agreed to disclosure to a certain extent, but not to divestment. Yeah, exactly. Um and they only disclose like already public information because I'm pretty sure they have NDAs like non-disclosure agreements on some of their like investments where they can't like publicize mm. uh, what they're investing in or whatever. So it's the the demands that have been met were like very very weak like it was pretty much nothing and the movement it hasn't has been dead ever since too it's been at a at a standstill for this past couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And I think the only thing that would be able to like revive it is like actual events, like the invasion of Rafa, like whatever happens in Palestine is the only thing that could revive the movement. Mm, that's a rather tragic dichotomy, isn't it? Of course, the whole point is that the invasion of Rafa might not happen were the movement to expand and develop and to connect with the working class and really hold yeah. the warmongering ruling class in the States by the throats. Um, on a more positive exactly. side, what sorts of conversations were our comrades from the Revolutionary Communists of America having with the student protesters on the ground? How receptive were people towards our communist and Marxist ideas? Very receptive. Um, I think people people will agree with, like, we need a revolution, but people don't really know what that fully means like there's a lot of confused ideas on what revolution actually is of course and when they hear like the marxist perspective on revolution people are immediately like that's an amazing idea like that's what you guys are preparing for that's why you guys are building this party it, it makes total sense to people and it's very awesome to see people's faces light up when they see what we're preparing for um people completely hate capitalism like the objective factor is there for us all we need to do is just keep growing keep tapping into this like revolutionary sentiment that is like prolific in america right now especially among the youth um yeah we were able to to sell a lot of newspapers we had people some some people uh, were like ready to join on the spot like we have comrades that we're consolidating right now Mm. that just joined just from meeting us that one day which was very awesome to see uh sometimes we would even kind of do like a chain reaction where like i talk to someone i tell them i'm part of the revolutionary communists of america they're like this is awesome i would like to be a part of this and then i immediately get them to start walking around with me to start organizing other people like kind of like a snowball effect you know Mm -hmm. and they immediately get to see what it's like, like what we do, what we're, how we intervene in the movement. You get to meet all the comrades the same day. It's it's a very awesome thing to be a part of. That's incredible. Um, That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really inspirational to see from London the explosive growth of our US organization. And I'm really looking forward yeah. to hearing the reports and speaking to the comrades in person at the founding conference of the Revolutionary Communist International, which, of course, is happening yeah in not too long 10th of june and if you're listening to this or watching this and you haven't signed up already then link is in the description so get signed up there's full online participation and all the talks we made available pretty much immediately so um there's no excuse not to get stuck in we're building a revolutionary world organization here and if we can win a powerful organization in the US of A, in the country of the Red Scare and the sure. uh, McCarthyism, the Reds under the bed, then there's nowhere that we can't win. Yeah. Most although, although I say that, I mean, it's not really surprising that the country 
that is the focal point for capitalism as most egregious crimes uh, is also seeing a very rapid radicalization, as you say, of young people in particular. So really, it's not surprising at all that the ideas of communism are uh, gaining popularity in the USA. Yeah, most definitely. There is a lot of suffering here in this country. I think 75 or 78 percent of people are living paycheck to paycheck. And sure. that frustration is just boiling and boiling. And we are the outlet that frustration like a way to actually fight this it's awesome to see people turning towards us to actually get organized that's great well uh thank you so much for joining us uh my loss i know that it's uh quite early where you are so i'll let you go oh. but um yeah. hope i can run into you at the rci conference in june oh yeah for sure have a good one thank you for having me thanks for coming on well I hope that you found that as inspiring as I did. And rest assured, all the comrades that you heard speaking and many, many others will be continuing to involve themselves in this protest movement and continuing the struggle to support the just demand for a Palestinian homeland, for an end to the bloodshed in Gaza, and for socialist revolution at home. Uh, ultimately, the only way to guarantee a decent existence for the Palestinians and indeed for all of humanity is to bring an end to the system that results in the horrors that we're seeing in imperialism, war, destruction, and so on. But it's not really enough to just say that. We can't look at the situation in the Middle East and say, well, we just need a socialist revolution. That's the end of the story. There's more to that. There's letters of the alphabet between A and Z. So what I'm going to ask you now, Fred, is what are we saying what are we saying as communists, as members of the IMT, about how this protest movement should develop, what strategy it needs, and what sort of demands it needs? Well, first of all, um, it, it's an extremely positive and healthy development that we have such a huge and widespread movement of youth uh, in solidarity with the um, Palestinian people. Um, and what this is the result of is months of demonstration after demonstration um which have had have had the, the i mean the only effect they've had which is obviously a positive is effect is to show how big the movement is how deep the anger is how widespread the opposition to the war in gaza is but it hasn't changed one bit the scenario on the ground it has had no impact on on Netanyahu, obviously, um, but and no impact on, on the Western governments. Sunak, for instance, has said that uh, is Britain is not going to do anything to uh, limit the delivery of weapons to uh, to Israel, for example. Mm. Um, so the sense amongst the young people is we've got to do something more. We've got to go beyond simply marching on a regular basis. So they did what they could do, which is to occupy the grounds of university campuses and raise some demands in the United States and then in other countries, such as uh, disclosure, which means basically, let's see the accounts, let's see the books, let's see where the money's coming from and where it's going. Let's see your financial connections with Israeli um, companies, with armaments companies, etc. And we want to see that in order to, to put the demand stop this investment, stop this connection um, as, as a way of hitting at the Israeli war machine. Absolutely correct. Um, but what needs to be done um, is to strengthen the movement because um, even a few encampments, however uh, successful they may be, have faced brutal police repression. In some cases, they've been completely physically cleared from, from the campus. Um, and this can be expected, obviously. Uh, we've seen it in one campus um, after another. Now, the way to strengthen it, first of all, is not to limit the movement only to the people who turn up, say, on the first day or the first few days. But what should happen is um, discuss what the aims are, democratically discuss that amongst all the participants, and then build up teams, delegations, to go and talk to the, um, the university staff. That has already happened in some campuses, and in some there's been spontaneous solidarity. We've seen the scenes of professors being manhandled by the police, handcuffed, brutally handcuffed, as if they were some kind of dangerous individual um, to the state. 
Um, that has happened. We need to build up that connection, that link between the staff of the universities, academic and non-academic, and the students, and then go beyond that, um, spread it from campus to campus. There are many campuses where there hasn't been a movement. Go there with delegations, campaign, poster, leaflet, send out appeals, um, spread the movement. And then we even within each campus, make it stronger by going faculty to faculty, going around the campuses, going to the students who are coming to the campus and talk to them. Make the movement stronger because if you want to send out a clear message, the stronger the movement is, clearly the, the more powerful the message. And the more powerful would be the effect of that movement on the working class as a whole. Right. Ordinary workers do not like to see their young people being brutally beaten by the police, mm. who uh, students who are peacefully protesting for a just cause, a cause which working class people sympathize with. That means there's a potential to spread it beyond the campuses, link up with workers. When there are strikes, for example, in Britain, we had an example in Liverpool where they went to the Aslef um, picket and they got a good reception from the workers, but also to, to, to shop stewards, uh, shop stewards committees, local trade union branches, raise the issue um, and build up a wider movement. We saw how in the 60s, such a such a movement developed how, how a powerful student movement that is repressed by the state in certain conditions can actually be a trigger to a wider movement of the working class if you can achieve that then you're starting to really have an impact in the united states in canada in britain and, and other countries and really hit home against the, the, your own ruling class in your own country, which is massively supporting the butchery in Gaza. The US supplies a lot of weapons. Germany supplies a lot of weapons. Italy supplies a lot of weapons to Israel and many other countries, Britain, etc. cetera. Um, to hit back at our own ruling classes and showing that the youth and the working class will not stand for this. Um, but the concluding thing I would say is this, I've heard discussions about, you know, what can we do um, in the sense of, you know, aid, voluntary stuff, charitable stuff. There's a lot of good people out there who do volunteer to help, such as the people working on the ground for the UN agencies. But as Marxists, as communists, we must also look at the bigger picture and realize this. Sooner or later, this war is going to end. It will end with the devastation of Gaza. Unfortunately, and it's not a, 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 a it, it's not a, something that one likes to say. There are Palestinians who are alive now who will be dead tomorrow and next week and next month. Um, many more will die because of this before the ceasefire is reached. The ceasefire eventually will come. There have been many ceasefires in the past. The, Ten years ago. There was the brutal uh, bombing and killing of thousands of Palestinians, and there was a ceasefire, and there was reconstruction. Now the, the, the bombing and the killing has been on a much bigger scale. We can reach a ceasefire, yes, and we hope we reach one as soon as possible to stop the killing and stop this butchery. But we have to think, will that be the final end to this butchery? We don't think so. So long as you have US imperialism in power, Western European imperialism in power, and these governments supporting um, the Israeli government and the Israeli regime, and so long as you have a capitalist class ruling over Israel, the Zionist um, uh, ruling class in this case, they will keep defending their material interests and their long-term project of taking more and more land they see this as just one further step in uh, trying to push out more Palestinians, creating the conditions where they, whereby they would want to flee, and taking over more land. This will continue so long as capitalism exists. So, um, you know, we can put a plaster to a gangrenous leg, but the person will die. But if we um, carry out the necessary operation, to remove the source of the gangrene, you might have a chance of survival. Here, the rottenness is in the ruling classes that govern this world, 
And as long as they're still in power, they will be fighting more wars and more destruction. Therefore, while fighting uh, against the 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 the, um, the people who support this war, while organizing the widest possible solidarity movement with the people of Gaza, we should also have a more long-term perspective and say, what should we be doing to eradicate war and destruction and butchery forever? That means fighting for a transformation of society, a society not based on profit. And that means a worldwide struggle for the ideas of genuine communism. We have to state that clearly. Some people say, oh, yeah, you should just limit your talk to the Palestinian situation. Um, but if we do that, this problem will erupt again and again and again. We don't want to see that. We want to see a genuine end to this conflict and turmoil. And that means putting an end to the capitalist society that spurns this horror. Here, hear. Thank you very much, Fred. That was excellent as ever. And thanks again to all the comrades from around the international who took part in this special episode. The plan is that that's us now until season two. But obviously we said that if something major happened in world politics, we'd come back with a bonus episode. And so we have. We're living in very tumultuous times. So no guarantees that you won't be hearing from me again before we launch the RCI officially and come back for season two of the spectrum of communism. So I won't say goodbye. I'll say see you next time. And before we finish, I want to make one last statement of solidarity from everyone here at the Spectre of Communism podcast, everyone organizing in the IMT, soon to be the RCI, solidarity with all the student protesters, with all the workers, with everybody standing up in solidarity with Palestine, enduring the slings and arrows of the bourgeois state and press, the communists fully support this struggle, this just cause, and will continue supporting this cause, raising revolutionary demands and encouraging this movement to develop, to reach out to the working class and to really strike a blow at the imperialist warmongers and the rotten Zionist regime that they support. So that's it from me for now. Fred, one more time, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time. Bye.